then God takes each one of the pieces and puts His glory on it, puts His anointing on it, puts His gifts in it, and then He sends it back out and it creates a harvest. Yes. But the messages today aren't being about broken. It's about being whole. It isn't about being a servant. It's about rising to the top. And, and the same thing Jesus had to deal with with the disciples. Lord, who's the greatest? And He says, you know, the greatest one of you of all is going to be the one who serves, one who lays his life down. Jesus girded himself with the towel and began to serve. He came from heaven, put his life on that cross, served humanity. That's the gospel. But we kind of gotten away from that for all the advantages that go from being saved, all the benefits that we receive because of our salvation, we focused, it seems, on those. And those have been the messages. And I want to bring it back around to where it needs to be. I see something that's alarming. That the church is full while the world is empty. And you watch church on TV. That church is full. And I don't mean chairs or pews. But I mean the people's lives are full. They're blessed. They're walking in prosperity. Their families are healed. And they're getting along great. Marriages are being restored. And all this is good. No, don't get me wrong. We live in a life of prosperity and blessing, my wife and I, and I'm appreciative of that. But the problem I have is when the church is living a life that's full while the world is empty. I have a problem with that. When the church house, the people's lives are full, yet the world is still broken. There ought to be something that causes us to look beyond what we receive and what we get to where the, the people who are lost are, and there ought to be a grieving. There ought to be something that causes us to say, God, I want to reach out. I want to stand in the gap. I want to intercede on behalf of all those people who aren't living. The Listen, when you give your life to the Lord and you're serving Him, God's going to bless you. Amen. And it may not be in material things. It may be in material things. It may not be in a restored marriage. It may be in a restored marriage. But whatever it is, good or bad, those are blessings that come from God because He uses them to keep us humble and to break it. You know, I, as I read... In the Word of God, I see over and over uh, Peter being filled with the Spirit of God more than once. Being filled, being filled, being filled. There's a song that we sing has a line in it. I am filled to be emptied again. And I think that is powerful. Where today's focus seems to be, I want to be filled so I can have. But really, we want to be filled so that we can give. Amen. We want to be filled so that we can pour into the life, so that we can serve, because that's the model of Jesus. He came to serve. And that's the model of, of the apostles and what I read in the New Testament. They came to serve. They laid their lives down, even to the point of being martyred. And today's church is just the opposite. We come to the kingdom of God so that we can receive it, so that we can get, so that we can build a bigger barn and have and hold on to what God wants to give us. To where what we really got to get back to is the focus. God, break me. Yes. God, break me. Yes. No, no, I'm not saying, God, take away and leave me miserable. But God, break me. Every part of me, and in my brokenness, use those parts to reach people for your glory and for your kingdom. Amen. Amen. In Joel 1, 17, it says, The seed shrivels under the clouds. Storehouses are in shambles. Barns are broken now because the grain is withered. One more time. The seed is shriveled. It's dried up. It's not doing anything. Why? Because it's underneath a clod. You know what a clod is? I grew up on a farm. A clod is a piece of dirt that is so hard that the seed is so dry that the seed can't get in there and find any moisture to put down any roots to grow up and to bear any fruit. That clod is actually suffocating. It's like a rock. You can take a cloud of dirt and throw that thing and maybe some pieces will break off the outside but the main part of that cloud stays intact. It's almost so hard it's almost like a rock. He says the grain, he said the seed is hidden under the clouds. It's shriveled under the cloud and the storehouses are in shambles. In other words, it's been happening for a long time. Yes. Can I break this down? I believe that the seed is the gospel. Because Jesus said, a farmer went out to sow seed. And he cast the seed and some fell along the path where the birds of the air came and snatched yes. the seed of the words. And he goes on to describe that as the word of God. The word of God, the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of God. And Joel was prophesying to the day that Israel was in. But I believe he was prophesying to the end of the age, which is the day that we live in right now. The seed is the gospel. And those clouds, 
are our unbroken hearts. They're the unbroken hearts of both believers and non-believers. But specifically, and I'll show this in a minute, I believe it's the hearts of the believers. Amen. Because the seed is the word of God hidden in our heart, and we're to go out and sow it. Come on. We're to go out and sow it. We're the farmers. We're to go out and sow the gospel of God. But the gospel, the seed, the word of God is shriveled up, and it's not doing anything because it's hidden under our claws, yes. under our heart and hearts. Because our gospel is confused. We think that we're here to get from God and to receive from God and to live this great life here and now where in all reality we're called to serve. Yes. We're called to lay our life down. Come on. For he who get, he who loses his life shall gain it for all eternity. But he yes. who keeps his life shall lose it. Yes. See the gospel's reversed. You don't want to preach on TV to audiences of millions that this is how God wants you to live because the people are going to change the channel and go to somebody that preaches something they want to hear. Too much emphasis is put on here and now and not enough on eternity. And eternity is a long time. Yes. The storehouses are in shambles. What's a storehouse? Well, the storehouse is the church. Because you see, the storehouse, when a, when a farmer has a barn, what's he put in the barn? He puts in the barn his crop. That's where he stores it. The storehouse it, it is where he would put his tools and his utensils and where he'd put his, uh, his plows or his, his equipment that he would use. We are the equipment of God. We are the vessels that God wants to use to go out and sow the seed of his gospel. Amen. And Joel says that, you know what? The storehouses of the churches, they're in shambles. Most of the church house is in a shamble. It's in a, a bad place because people have been preaching and focusing on the wrong thing. And the, and the members of the church have lost their faith because what the preachers have been promising, if you do this and you do that, God will do this and that. It's not happening for them and their faith is being diminished because the false gospel is being preached and they're not focusing on what God really, really is looking for us. And I want to get to that at the very closing of the message. Last thing he says, the barns are broken down. The barns are where you store your bumper crop. But the barns are broken down because there's nothing being put in them. People, people, you know, I heard a statistic that there are more people, this was about 10, 12 years, maybe even longer years ago, more people were getting saved than being born. And that was encouraging. But if we look at the statistics today, all those people that were getting saved are no longer serving God or following God. Amen. Not to their shame. But to the shame of the ministers and the pastors Amen. and the leaders who are not really preaching the truth of God's word to encourage them and to equip them for what they're going to face when they go out. When you get saved, everything doesn't just fall into place, does it? No. Nope. But yet God holds everything in place, yes, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Amen. And so, so many people are expecting things that don't happen. And they want to question themselves too. They question God. And they have fallen away. And now the barns are broken down because there's nothing to put in them. And that is where I think we have to, as believers, just wrap our arms around the truth and what God is really wanting. When we live in brokenness, and I see the members of this church, and I see a lot of brokenness, and that blesses me because we're to live in brokenness. We're to live a life to where we are broken before God. Yes. Because that keeps us dependent on God. Come on. That keeps us free from the intervention of man. When we are broken and we learn to live in the brokenness of God. And we, live, we, we keep that umbilical cord to God uh, intact. We're no longer tempted by man's influence. We're no longer oh, drawn away by what man wants to do to help us fix our problems. It's okay to be broken. It's okay to be broken. Yes. It's okay to not always get the victory. Yes. It's okay to not always overcome and see this great, this great victory. It's okay because God uses that. Yes. You see, but this isn't what people want to preach to. But if we're always living on the mountain, if we're always living in victory, we have a tendency to become arrogant, <laughs> prideful, independent. It's when we go through those valleys. David, when he wrote the 23rd Psalm, didn't say, if you shall go through the valley of the sin. He said, when? Because those are the times where God makes the low roads high and the high roads low. He brings balance into our life. To where we don't become so dependent or, or addicted 
to the victory and all that to where we begin to forget God because that's when we become vulnerable to the attacks of Satan and our pride sets in our arrogance. We become out of touch with other people. We can no longer relate to their problem. Well, how come you've got this issue going on? You must be doing something wrong. Well, who isn't doing something wrong? Come on, just a minute. Let's back this thing up. Who isn't messing up in their life? Come on. And when we when we, we preach or we, we live our life and we have this mindset that if they're doing something, you know, if they've got this going on, well, they must be doing something wrong. I remember I remember people that used to live on the verge of poverty in our church in Ember, and we used to constantly think, that, well, you know, they don't tithe. And they're living that way because they don't tithe. And I believe for the most part that's a good rule of thumb. If you don't tithe and you don't work, you don't eat. 